Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Teacher Summit 2020 Leaders, Leader Summit Virtual Series. My name is Leslie, and I will be your session host moderator today. Uh, we ask that the participants keep their microphones and videos off for the remainder of the session unless specifically asked to turn on from a presenter. Uh, you are attending the session A105, Assessing School of Physical Education and its teachers, and your presenters are Kaylin and Carrie Lee. Go ahead, girls, get it. Hey, y'all. Um, I hope y'all enjoyed our dance break. Um, so Karen and I will be talking today about physical education, um, what it should look like based on best practices, and also what it should look like if you happen to be assessing your physical educators with the Compers rubric. So I'm going to give most of the outline and Carrie's going to jump in um, and some, provide some specific examples. Um, so first off, like I said, my name is Kaylin. I currently work at UL Lafayette. Previously at LSU, um, Carrie Lee uh, was one of my mentor teachers that I place student teachers with every semester. She's a great teacher. Um, and we both are on the board for Layford, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. So first, before we get started, if you've come to any of our health or wellness sessions, um, these are being done in partnership with Louisiana Healthy Schools, um, Well Ahead Louisiana, which is the Department of Louisiana Department of Education. Um, this organization receives federal funding to help strengthen the infrastructure of health, the health councils, um, getting healthy food and more activity within our schools. Um, and then on that slide, we have live links. So this PowerPoint can be per, uh, found on your Sketch app. Um, and then again, we have live links within the PowerPoint. When we created it, we really wanted it to be a usable tool. So we may not get into a lot of specifics today or go in depth with some of these links, but they are provided there for y'all so y'all can have after we leave the session today. Like I men mentioned, both Carrie, Carrie and myself are members of LAFER. It's the Louisiana Association for Health, Physical Education, Recreation, and Dance. Um, basically, we just are the main organization or one of the main organizations in the state that provides specific professional development in the field of physical education, but also we do a lot of work to advocate for physical activity in schools, to have proper PE, and we partner with a lot of organizations like BREC, YMCAs across the state when it comes to the recreation, um, and making sure that our students can be active for a lifetime once they leave our schools and enter our communities as adults. For more information, again, that's a live link to our website. We do have a conference um, every year in November in Baton Rouge. All right, so now we're going to get into our assessment objections. So first we're going to briefly go over appropriate and inappropriate practices of physical education. We're going to compare inappropriate practices with some new age information. Um, and then towards the end, again, we're going to align what this looks like when compared to the Compress rubric. So some important notes, we're going to review some general information regarding the um, Louisiana state standards. Again, that's a live link to our standards. We do have standards K through 12 um, in the state of Louisiana for physical education. We actually rewrote the standards. I was on the committee for that with the state Louisiana Department of Education. Um, and we have new standards that were published in 2017. Um, so you can find those on the LDOE website. So just some background information that I want to talk about. Um, there's a lot of research and a lot of misinformation out there regarding physical activity. We know that it has benefits for um, mental health. We know that physical activity has benefits for overall health. Um, but a lot of people think that the key to getting more um, time in the seats in our schools or the more um, ways that we can increase our test scores is to take away physical activity. And research actually shows that that's not the case. It's just because we're having students in their seats longer during the school day doesn't mean that that's quality time. So there's a link between health and learning. The more healthy our students are, the more active they are, actually the better they perform in the classroom. Okay. One of the big things that I want to differentiate here is there is an important difference between recess and physical education. They both are rights for our students and they serve two different purposes. They're both opportunities for students to be able to get physical activity during the day, which is really important. Whereas recess is a place for students to explore on kind of on their own. We can provide them with um, some resources, some balls, some equipment to play with, but it's a thing, a place for them to explore on their own and practice skills in their own, whereas physical education is more structured, it's guided by the teachers, and it should be guided by standards in GLEs or grade level expectations. 
So they're both really important in their own right, and they're both, uh, both developmentally appropriate for our students. I'm not going to read these stats to you, but again, they're there for you as a resource, and these are provided um, with more specifics in those state standards documents. Okay, so what we are um, really pushing for in the field of physical education right now across the country is physically literate individual. And physical literate individuals means that overall individuals have the skills to participate. So for instance, when they leave our K through 12 PE programs, they can go into their communities, whether it's, I see somebody's from Youngsville, whether it's at Youngsville Sports Complex and participate in an adult softball league or a church softball league, or an adult soccer league. They have the skills to do that. They know the benefits of activity for lifelong health. Um, a physically literate uh, participant participates regular in physical activity. So that means they're getting their 30 to 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous activity every day. The person is physically fit, but that they also value it. So it's not just a chore for them, but they really care about their physical activity and they value it as part of not only their physical, but their mental health. So these are the goals for us K through 12, because our goals when our students leave our school system is that we really want them to be physically active throughout a lifetime. So we want to do that by teaching them a lot of different skills um, in a lot of different game categories and a, a lot across a lot of different areas. All right, so there's four essential components. And right now I'm kind of giving the background information of physical education. If at any point you have a question, please don't hesitate to put a comment in the chat. I have it up, so hopefully I can see it. Um, but if not, I'll get to it at the end. We'll leave a, a place for comments, but please don't hesitate to ask questions. So I'm giving you some background information so we can kind of paint a really good picture of PE or physical education. So then when we start talking about the compost rubric and specific examples, you kind of have more of an understanding of what we're talking about. So the four essential uh, components of physical activity are um, an opportunity to learn, meaningful content for our students, appropriate instruction. We're gonna talk about what all these mean, just a second. And then also student um, and program assessment. Okay, so if you look at the picture here, you'll notice students are in about groups of two. Um, they have open space. If you look against the fence line on the right, you can see some of the little targets that we have out. And this was the um, a part of our striking unit. And the students are learning tennis. Um, obviously, this is something that they can start using throughout their life and go to a, a local Y or a tennis court and be able to use these skills that they're learning. But you'll notice that at least half the students have equipment and the students that are standing there, we have appropriate and meaningful content because they are also cognitively involved with assessing and watching their peers and helping provide that peer feedback. Um, so that's kind of, I'm gonna give y'all a brief overview on each picture so that y'all understand where the pictures are coming in at. All right, so the first concept of quality physical education is the opportunity to learn. So all students should participate in physical education. A lot of times in schools, um, I've been in several schools that they'll pull out students for a lot of different reasons, whether it is uh, reading remediation or to make up tests or they were late that day. But physical education is a right and a lot of the students that get pulled are the ones that need it the most. Um, daily opportunities for physical education is preferred. Class size should be approximate with other content areas. When I was teaching physical education in a K-12 setting, one of my classes had 80 people in one class, and I was in charge of those 80 um, individuals. Now, knowing what I know now, I should have brought that issue to my administration, but I was a brand new first year teacher. I really didn't know any better, but we should be following those regulations within a physical education setting. Um, just like in the classroom, we want qualified teacher, the curriculum should be developmentally appropriate. The ways that we make sure that it's developmentally appropriate is that we follow those GLEs. That's what we've outlined within the standards. And that our equipment and facilities should be adequate and safe. So the example that I use with all my future physical education teachers um, when I'm teaching at the university is we would never try to teach math or one of the core subjects and not have a book for every student. So why do we try to teach a soccer yet lesson for 30 or 40 students with only one or two balls? it's not really developmentally appropriate and they're not getting enough practice time for our students. So that's just something to take into account with opportunities to learn for our students. The next area is meaningful content. So again, our lesson plan should be written and it should be based on the state standards. Um, 
we should be teaching our students across all three domains within physical education. So making sure our students can do the skills, they know the skills, and then they understand how to do it in a safe, social, and emotional way. Okay, so those are the three domains. We call them psychomotor, cognitive is the knowledge, and then effective is that kind of social domain. Um, physical fitness and education is part of this. Now, depending on how you do it, it's going to depend on your school. It's very hard to do proper fitness testing and instruction when you only see your students once a week for 30 minutes. And we vary greatly across the state with how much activity in physical education our students get. Um, and so there's some other notes there, but meaningful content, we need to make sure that it's relevant to our students. The next area is appropriate instruction for our students. Um, so teaching targets, um, inclusion of all students. So this is really imp important because like Carrie mentioned in the picture that she showed, all of our students need to be included in our lessons. They need to be well organized. So we minimum, minimize transition time, just like in the classroom setting. Um, and we wanna make sure that they're all included, whether that means that we're arranging it appropriately with, the, with uh, uh, adequate equipment, et cetera. If we don't have equipment for all of our students, we might can do stations. So that way they can be working on different things. Um, I have some colleagues that aren't a fan of homework for PE, but out of school assignments to me are quality and a part of learning. It doesn't have to be homework, but if we can show them and send them home to do certain activities, maybe it's a physical activity bingo that they can do 10 minutes of activity at home. We're showing our students that they really care about this activity. The next point I really want to take a second and talk about physical activity or exercise should not be administered or withheld as punishment. So what do we mean by that? Okay, I want to take a note here that we are differentiating varsity sport at the high school level from physical activity. Okay, so I get that sometimes when we're coaching high school, students are late, we have them run laps or whatever. That is not developing appropriate for physical education and research actually shows that that turns students off of being physically active. Um, so that's an example of using physical activity as punishment. Um, the opposite is withholding it as punishment. So again, I used this example before. A lot of times we may have students that come into school late or they need to make up an assignment. So what do we do? We pull them from recess, we pull them from physical education. That's definitely not appropriate and okay because a lot of times those students need that, uh, that release, that physical exercise and activity. Um, so these are some things to keep in mind and we have some suggestions for how to work around that um, that we can get to if there's any questions um, about that. And then the last core area of quality instruction or components of physical education is um, student and program progression. So just like we test in all the other areas, we should be testing in physical education. And this doesn't necessarily mean physical fitness testing. We're not talking about the president fitness challenge, but even making sure that we're assessing, can they do the skills that we say? Can they answer on an exit slip the rules of the game or the skill cues of a skill that we're teaching? Can they list out how to be a good teammate and what we're looking for? There's lots of ways to assess individuals within our classroom, and it's important that we do that. We also want to make sure that those assessments align with this, the PE standards that we have. Um, you know, when I was in elementary school and middle school, I would often get tests or exams in PE that asked me, hey, what is the square footage of the basketball court? I don't necessarily need to know that to be able to understand and play basketball. That doesn't necessarily align with the standards. Um, instead, I could be asking questions about the skill cues or about the strategies and the tactics of the game. And that's really where we know that if students learn it in our classroom, they can apply it and take it with them outside of those classroom. And then finally, we need to make sure that we're assessing our programs. Okay, so do we have a quality program? Are we making sure that we're meeting the needs of our students? Um, do we have the equipment? Do we have the facilities needed for all of our students to be active um, within our classrooms? Okay, so some appropriate practice, which I've covered most of them, um, but I just wanna take a minute to talk about. So appropriate practices would be standards-based curriculum, which I've mentioned, the use of small-sided games. So one suggestion here is a lot of times we get our class in half versus half, whether it's a basketball game or a volleyball game, but think about the parent sport or the big sport, if that's what you're basing your curriculum on. Um, volleyball's the biggest example. I've been into a lot of classrooms where we have 16 people versus 16 people like on each other versus a net. Well, real volleyball, the parent sport is six v six. 
So we're playing these games and activities, which are far more um, larger than the parent sport, and that's giving our students less activity. So we need to think small-sided, 2v2, 3v2, uh, 3v3, 4v4, depending on the size of the parent game and also the equipment that we have and the age of our students. Um, provide autonomy and choice when possible. So for instance, when I'm teaching um, my students about volleying, like again for volleyball, I give them choice. We start out with balloons. Can you strike this ball or set this ball or serve this ball, following the correct skill cues 10 times in a row? Once you can, you get to move up to a trainer volleyball. Once you feel comfortable there and you can do it correctly, then you can move up to, you know, the professional or the real volleyball. Another way that's an appropriate strategy to teach um, within physical ed education is teaching non-traditional activities. So again, the kids that are um, interested in sport often will sp play sport, and I'm not saying we shouldn't teach sports, but teaching non-traditional activities such as Omnikin or Chook ball and if you never heard of those you know go look them up because they're great games it kind of evens that playing field and it intrigues those students um, and that way a lot of students aren't coming in with previous knowledge so that way it's really leveling the playing fields for students to participate so for instance if i'm teaching baseball and half my students have already played t-ball when they're four well they're going to be far above where all those other students who haven't gotten the chance to play yet um, so if I teach a game like, like Omnikin, nobody's ever played Omnikin, maybe one or two have even heard of it, it levels that playing field and it makes for a really good learning experience. Again, we should be promoting enjoyment of the activity and we want to elicit higher order thinking just like we would in the classroom. So instead of asking basic questions like, hey, what, how do you throw a ball? What are the tactics? What are the strategies? And we can really connect to that core um, content. Some other things that we want to think about is um, traditionally, if you walk in, especially if you're an administrator and you walk into um, a physical education class, Carrie's going to talk about this picture in just a second, you might have 15 versus 15 in a relay race. Well, think about the activity time of those students. The majority of the time they are standing there. Um, for mi middle school and high school where kids dress out, sometimes I've been in schools where they allow 10, 15 minutes for their students to dress in and out. That's far too long and not needed. It decreases activity time, but it also gives way to students um, getting off task, getting in fights, um, bickering things in the locker room. Um, it really needs to be developmentally appropriate. So if we can keep students on task and we can promote choice. So for instance, have your baseline activity, have opportunity for students that are a little bit less skilled and those for high skilled, they all stay on task. Because so, what happens if low skilled students are far too challenged, they give up, they start acting out, cause a distraction so their friends don't realize they can't do it, and it becomes a behavior issue in the classroom. Same thing for your high school students. If we don't have an appropriate challenge for them, they get bored, they get off task, and again, it's the same situation that occurs. Um, there's a lot of um, inappropriate practices that we still see. So a lot of high schools, middle schools will select or split their physical education versed on boys versus girls. Um, and then they offer completely gendered type of activities. So boys first unit is football and girls is dance. It should be equal opportunity. And we need to still make sure that we're hitting all of the GLEs because those are skills that's important to all of our students. Um, you know, using students as targets is not appropriate. Um, as a teacher, when it comes to instruction, we need to make sure that we're explaining and also providing demonstrations. Um, we need to make sure that we're not just um, giving rewards or, or, um, or celebrating just the outcome, but the process and students that are doing those processes correctly. I could go on and on, um, but I won't. Right now, Carrie, she's gonna talk about what's happening in this picture. So if you look close to the picture in the background, you'll notice that we are using a PowerPoint, a projector um, in this activity. This activity, the goal was to get the buckets flipped over or upside down um, based on a number that you rolled. You had to go flip that, that bucket around. It was obviously to get the kids moving as soon as they got into the room. They've played this before. And you'll notice that on there it says um, calf raises. So the student that just finished going to flip their bucket would stand in the back of the line. And while they were waiting their turn to move forward, they would be performing calf raises. And then they would move forward one position to the rest position. That way you are instilling that, yes, we understand that you can't move um, 
all, the whole entire class, you do need a little bit of rest time. So then they move to the rest position and then they become the roller and they'd roll the dice and do the activity again. Um, the exercise on the screen would change as well as whatever way we wanted them to move down the line. Uh, I think right there, I think they're doing crab walk is what they were doing. Um, so it might go skip, gallop, hop, leap, jump, any of those locomotor skills. Um, but that's just a little way to break them into smaller groups, keep someone moving, have them resting, and then have them participating. Another common thing that uh, a lot of you might have seen on Facebook was the paper, rock, scissors video with the hula hoops, where there was two long, long lines on each side of the gym, and two kids would jump, and as they got closer, they would, uh, whenever they would meet, they would play game of paper, rock, scissors, and then the winner would keep going and the person that lost would get out and go to the back of their line. In a class of 30, two kids are moving. That means the rest are not. Um, so if you're teaching jumping, uh, hopping, any of those locomotor skills, the better way to break that one down would be to make um, shorter lines. We've done that activity in our elementary school where we worked on uh, the, the different locomotor skills, but we only had, it was three versus three so where they're uh, le a lot less standing around, the kids absolutely loved it. It looked like they enjoyed it more than the kids on the video. So um, I think definitely making sure that we are uh, finding those fun activities, but making them work for what is appropriate is best. Yeah, great examples, Carrie. Um, something else that Carrie has done in her school, which is very similar, um, she's done partner work or groups of three, and she calls it going fishing. And she puts all sorts of poly spots in the gym and the students are practicing their underhand toss and they toss the bean bag. And if it lands on the poly spot and they can pick up the poly spot without it falling off, they've caught the fish. Well, the partner is actually given a piece of paper and they are doing peer assessment. So that's another way to get assessment in the class. So if I was Carrie's partner, that's a bad example. If I was, you know, Timothy's partner um, and I'm saying that he's doing everything right, but Miss Lee notes that Timothy's not doing it correctly, she can compare my feedback and understand that I'm not getting it cognitively. So that's a really good comparison. It's informal, but it's a way to still get the students thinking in that cognitive domain. The examples that we just gave obviously are more appropriate for elementary, but you can do very similar things with secondary, middle school, and high school with some different curricular models or different activities. One curricular model um, that we really love is the sport education model, and that is basically students are assigned small groups at the beginning of a unit. Every student has their role, so somebody's the coach of their group, somebody's the fitness leader, somebody's the referee of their group. So even if they're not participating in activity, they're in charge of their role. So just because sometimes students aren't being physically active, it doesn't mean that they're not cognitive or effectively engaged. And that's something just to note um, when you walk into your gym setting or your auditorium, wherever physical education is, that there's a difference between standing in lines and being cognitively engaged. And it's important that we understand what's going on in our physical education settings. All right, so now a couple of inappropriate practices, which we've mentioned, the exercises punishment. Um, we've already mentioned that one a little bit, putting students on display. So we've talked about this and we've seen this in lots of different, um, not just PE settings, but knowing your students. If a student can't get it, um, time out, Ashley, um, I will, at the, our last slide is our contact information. I have the perfect book and I have some PowerPoints. So write my email down and I will send you those resources. It's great. It's called the complete guide to the sport ed model. I love it. I teach it to my college students. When I was in um, K-12, I taught it to my high schoolers and they loved it. So I'll definitely send you that. Just make sure you email me after. Um, okay. Putting students on display. Um, again, yeah. like know your students. So if I know that a student isn't great at this certain skill, that student probably shouldn't be my demonstrator. Um, calling students out inappropriately across the gym. Obviously, I would wanna pull that student aside one-on-one -on -one if there's an issue. We already talked about full-sided games. Students choosing captains, okay? You can look at this any way you want, but having a couple of students pick their teams is inappropriate, not just because we all, maybe some of y'all might not, but the last kid standing is not the funnest place to be. But think about that from just a transition perspective. How long does that take? If Carrie Lee and I are team captains and we both want to, you know, pick 
I'm going to coach Jay Davison because we know that coach Davison is super athletic and wants to be great on team. Well, Carrie picks coach Davison and uh, well now I have to start all over. And how long does it take me to figure out my next pick? Um, so just from a transition perspective, okay. Get toe to toe with a partner, five, four, three, two, one. Great. Taller partner, go to that side of the gym, shorter partner, that side of the gym. That took maybe 10 seconds versus that process of choosing teams. That's just something to think about. Team shake. I'm sure a lot of y'all have used that for um, some of y'all's partners in class. Team shake. Do that before the class. You can put in every class's roster. Shake it up. They're automatically in teams. Um, you can call them out real quick. Or if you have a smart board, it projects. Um, exclusion or basis of participation. We've talked about that. There's no reason to be pulling students out from recess or physical education. Doing activities just to do activities without learning objectives. That's a big no-no. Again, we want to teach the standards, um, specifically in physical activity, we're, or physical education, we're all about advocacy. We know that we have some old school teachers not doing what they need to do, um, but we know that that's not the right way to do it. Um, so we need to be teaching to the GLEs to make sure that we're making well-rounded students. And then with that, no assessment's not appropriate. How do we know not only if our students are learning what they need to, but as a teacher, I need to assess to make sure I'm doing my job as the teacher um, to make sure that, you know, I'm teaching. If 75 of my students, percent of my students aren't getting it, I did something wrong. So we really need that assessment. All right, so now we're fixing to go into the actual compass rubric, but I wanna give about 30 seconds. Does anybody have any questions? Um, the PowerPoint is in the Sketch app. Um, if not, again, email me at the end, write it down, and I'll make sure to email you the PowerPoint. Okay, does anybody else have any questions about the general PE overview before we move forward looking at the Compress rubric? All right, if you do, don't hesitate um, to type something in the chat and we will make sure to get to it. Okay, so um, basically the way that we structure this next part of the PowerPoint, now that we've kind of given you some of that background information, is we've just taken the big overview sections of the Compress rubric. Um, we're gonna talk about some of those specific things that we're looking for to be highly effective. And then we're just gonna give you in general some suggestions. If you need more suggestions, if you need clarity, if you want a recommendation or a suggestion for a specific grade level, just again, put it in the chat and we'll try to make sure we get to everybody. So the planning and the prep, uh, preparation section, just in general, the, the key takeaways from the section of the Compress rubric is that the outcome should describe what students are learning, not what they do. So when we're teaching our future physical education teachers, we really like them to write objectives. The learner will blank. And it is a requirement within both uh, the program at UL and both the program at uh, LSU when I was teaching there and that they continue to teach is that our students write a learning objective for each domain. What are they going to be able to do by the end of the lesson? But what are they going to be able to have learned cognitive? And then what are they going to be able to perform or demonstrate in that social or effective domain? So again, we don't want to say, okay, well, they're just going to hit a ping pong off of the table, which Carrie's going to talk about this picture in a minute but they're gonna learn, okay, if my, if my person I'm playing is, is on the right side, I'm gonna hit that ping pong to the left because that's where the open space is. And that is the strategy of this game to be successful, okay? So the outcomes must lend themselves to various forms of assessment. Again, we're assessing across all three different um, domains and we're doing it visually, maybe with a teacher checklist, with an exit slip, that exit slip can be a demonstration. It could be on the skill cues. It could be about the rules or the strategies or the tactics of the games. And again, um, once more, it's covering those three domains. So Carrie's gonna show what's happening with her students in this picture um, in regards to those three domains. So uh, for those that, I, I don't know if I introduced myself at the beginning. I am Carrie, I work at uh, Zachary Elementary School, which is the third and fourth grade school in Zachary. We are very fortunate that we do have a lot of equipment um, for activities in our physical education classes. And we do see the kids every day for PE. Um, but that, we, that doesn't keep me from getting creative and doing things that maybe don't require the most expensive equipment that you have. So you'll notice in this, um, you'll notice brown tables and white tables. 
and a wiffle ball is what we are using for this activity. Um, this is a sh part of our striking unit. It's called table ball. This specific day is four way table ball. We teach table ball with um, one person on each end of one long table. And then we start to incorporate strategies. Okay, now what if we put two tables together? Okay, what if we did this with a round table? How would it work with a round table? So the students are always constantly trying to figure out, okay, well, how do we take the rules of this game and adapt it to this lesson? And we've even had students um, help, well, can we add in a second ball? Sure, let's try it. You know, that's the students coming up with ways to improve the game as well. So if you notice, there are four people and um, actively engaged in the striking part of the game. And then there's a fifth person that's standing off to the side. If you look all the way in the far back, you'll notice those two, you can see them standing. Their job is the referee. So they are watching the game and they are refereeing the game to make sure that the students are following the rules that they were giving. And if there's any uh, conflicts in who was out and uh, who was in, they would be that person that would step in and, uh, and make that decision for the game. And we do have a rule um, if, the, if the referee cannot tell them what happened, it is a replay. Perfect. And then this goes back to, to uh, giving students choice, like Carrie said, the different rules. Can we do this? The different tables. Um, striking is a really hard skill for students to learn. So they could start out with their hand with a bigger ball, one of the big, you know, foam balls, then move to the wiffle, then add a small, a short, um, a short paddle, a long handled paddle. So there's different ways that you can provide choice and modifications for all the different skill levels of the students. So this is just a really great example to talk about how they're engaged physically, cognitively, like with um, the referee and even effectively. So, you know, uh, Carrie Lee teaches, well, what happens if our ball goes into another person's court? You know, they freeze and everybody stops and is respectful and returns the ball. So it's a really good activity. Um, but again, there's an objective for each one of those domains and she's grading and observing and watching that throughout the lesson. So on the conference rubric, here are kind of the two takeouts. So if you ever scroll through, all we did was pull out the highly effective um, and you can read through the bullets. We're not going to read through them today. Um, but the, the one on the right is the critical attribute. So that's kind of the more specific areas that we're looking for. So again, highly effective um, that we're choosing a curriculum to use for a framework that we have lesson plans um, that the teacher connects is, connects to previous and future learning. So again, um, you know, in the core content areas, we often talk about a scope and sequence. So the scope of what you're teaching and then the sequence of the order that you're going to teach it throughout the year. Well, we should do that within physical education. We, we should not just throw random units together and have, you know, no plan, um, especially with uh, previous and future learning. You know, Carrie Lee plans out for her two grades. You know, in a perfect world, we would do this throughout the district. We would, you know, get together. I I, if I'm an elementary school teacher, I know my feeder schools or where my teachers are coming from or where my students are going. And as a group, we're going to plan to make sure that we're not teaching the same thing every year because that would be boring for the students, that they have the skills they need to move on and be successful at the next level. There is a proper order to teach. K2 should really focus, and this is in the standards, but it should really focus on those intro skills, locomotion, um, motor skills. Three, five is intro to small sided game play. Middle school is really the team sport type area. And then high school should focus on lifetime activity. If we're just doing sports after sports after sports, we're not hitting all the GLEs. There's no way because there's GLEs that has nothing to do with sports. They have to do with fitness and lifetime activities. Um, so that's really something. So scope and sequence and planning for the future and previous learning is very important. Um, and then again, outcomes are differentiated are differentiated for individual students. So again, this is when the choice comes in and making sure that we have options for both low and high skilled students. So again, sometimes the easiest way to do this is with equipment, but also like if I'm teaching something as simple as throwing or, you know, striking, Carrie Lee and I start five feet from each other. When you have five successful throws or catches or whatever your rubric says or whatever you're looking for, you get to take two steps back. So after the end of those three to four minute activity, again, one activity should not last 20 minutes, but you might have students who are still five feet apart and that is okay. And you might have students who are the, you know, fully across the gym from each other. And that's great too, 
but they're being challenged individually. Um, you may start out with a trainer ball, um, or maybe we're, we're, we're practicing tracking for fielding. So maybe we start out with a big gator ball, and then we move to um, a tennis ball, and then our, our hard challenge is a racquetball because they bounce a lot. Those are appropriate challenges, and they can move up on those levels as um, it fits for those students. Okay, so these are just kind of pulled out from that rubric. So now we're going to talk about some examples. I've given a few, um, but the lesson and student objectives should be visible in the area. So whether you have a smart board or not, we need whiteboards in the gym, um, in the auditoriums. If we don't have those, you can take a big poster board or carpenter paper, um, you know, laminate it, put contact paper, pin it on the wall, and whiteboard markers work for that. Um, so that's something really easy, but our objectives for our students should not be a secret. They are not a secret in math or science. They should not be a secret in physical education. I'm a firm advocate that physical education is just as important as our core subjects. So it shouldn't be a guessing game for our students. This is what we want you to learn today. This is what we're gonna do and that should be posted for our students. Something else that's important is that we want our students to set short and long-term goals. Um, and this doesn't have to just take place with fitness testing. Um, but we can have them in small groups and partners. Um, if we have colored groups, just like in the classroom, the red table, the green table, we can have those same groups within PE and give our students a minute or two once a week, every day. It's up to you and how long you see your students, but they can discuss their goals, whether it's within a unit or long term across the semester or the school year. A journal is really beneficial. Um, if you're a school that has heart rate monitors or even pedometers, um, you know, we can pop those in. Um, that can be a great example. So, for instance, one of the schools that I've taught at, we had those shoe hangers that you can get, um, you know, at Walmart for a couple of bucks, and they all had numbers on them. And, you know, we assigned our students 1 through 30, and they would know they'd get their, you know, 50-cent pedometer. It's not the best, but, hey, when you don't have money, you, you do what you got to do. They would put it on, um, and then at the end of every day, they would track their steps, at the end, they, they know where they go back. And then at the end of the week, we would add up our steps. So great, integration of math. Then we would have challenges this week. You know, maybe it was compared to the LSU uh, schedule. Can we have enough steps to walk to Alabama? Because we're playing Bama this week. Great. Then we take all the kids' scores, or maybe that's their homework assignment. And again, that's um, just a little way to incorporate some corn content. Okay. Students can make connections to other learning uh, areas per discussion prompt. So again, in that journal, um, we can make today we played tennis. Okay. So where in the community do you know that you can go to play tennis? I want you to write at least two sentences with proper grammar. Um, and I'm checking for spelling. Great. We're integrating English. Okay. If we expect classroom teachers to do some physical activity breaks, which we are really fond of and students should not be sitting for longer than 20 or 30 minutes at a time anyway, then I want to be supportive as that as well. Um, so Carrie, she has one or two other suggestions, I think, for this one. I think you hit them actually on that. Was pretty okay, good. so we're good? Yep. Sorry, sometimes I talk too much. All right, so that's <laughs> just one example. You know, we're, we're filled with all. So if we, um, if you have something that you're thinking of, you know, ask us, comment in the thing, or even email us after we can provide some more feedback. All right, the next area on the rubric is classroom management. So key takeaways from this and these takeaways I've really I've read through just these areas of the compress rubric and I've pulled out kind of the high notes. So again, teacher establish and monitors the routine and procedures. All tasks are effective in making sure that there's momentum, but also that there's maximizing activity time. OK, one of the biggest areas that I harp on for my students um, and again, my students are pre teachers, so they are in the university setting is transition time. You have to put a lot of focus on how can you quickly get a class of 30 into groups of four and each group has two bean bags and a hula hoop and a poly set sped up in a particular way and then students start activity within 30 seconds. That's a transition and we want that to be quick so we can maximize the activity time. Okay, and then also that student self is, uh, initiate the procedures and they are aware, aware of certain protocols, whether that's when I say freeze, what do you do with equipment? Always make my students put equipment on the ground. When I say freeze, the first couple of weeks, I, I stay there. Mm, I love what Carrie's doing. What's Carrie doing that you might not be doing? And they know to put their equipment on the ground and we practice until they all get it. Um, and that way they're paying attention to me when I give instruction. Carrie's gonna talk a little bit of, um, more about some procedures that she has and also what's going on in this picture. 
So um, one of the biggest things for us, some days we'll end up having close to 125 kids in the auditorium at once. We have five PE teachers with those 125, but if it's raining and it was a fitness day and we really want the kids to move, we'll have a lot of kids. Um, we have routines for everything. When they come in, they know uh, a lot of times we'll do a short walk and talk so that the first thing they do, they've been sitting in a desk, they've been sitting still, they've been walking in a silent line. Well, just get it out. Come in, There's there might be a discussion uh, question on the board. Um, you may walk and talk with a partner discussing the question on the board. There you're getting some cognitive thought going, you're getting the kids moving, you're getting the kids talking. Um, the next thing, if you run into substitute teachers, we have um, our policy for the restroom. The kids know it, they are to ask one of their everyday PE teachers uh, if they can use the restroom. And then they know the sign out process. They go to the, uh, the sign out sheet. They sign themselves out with the time. They sign themselves back in. This is done to make things orderly and to keep track of all your students. If there's a fire drill, you know where everybody is. This is... Um, big on classroom management has really helped with us uh, with something that we've done. So just that, that overall um, also like little things like, Hey, Hey class and the students respond, Hey, Hey coach. And you know, you do it over and over and you repeat, repeat the process until they understand you're not moving on. You're not doing anything different. This is the way it's going to be. They're going to start answering and they're going to get quiet so that you can keep going with, uh, with the activities. Um, now, classroom management, this specific picture, um, we are in Louisiana, and this was around Mardi Gras, right? Actually, it was right before uh, Mardi Gras break, and it was a rainy day. Uh, we, it was, the grounds were wet outside, so we ended up having a lot, about 100 in, in the auditorium at one time. We were doing a fitness activity, so the students had um, little charts and a dice. They would roll the dice and figure out what activity they were going to do to earn a piece of equipment. Now, if you notice, that's a lot of equipment there scattered out on the ground. Um, this was where we wanted the kids to use their imagination and to think uh, and be creative. And the pieces of equipment that they would earn within a five minute period, they would then get two minutes to assemble with their group, a Mardi Gras float, whatever they wanted. Um, they each had a hula hoop to start with. We didn't have any rules about um, that the hula hoop couldn't be part of it or that it had to stay inside of the hula hoop. It was really up to the students to be creative, but they were doing um, all the physical activity together. And then that one student that was in charge of going to get the equipment, which changed each time, would go get the equipment and then they would build. So it was a, a lot of fun, but it was, um, if you walk in as an administrator to see this, I'll tell you right now, it was, it's organized chaos, but all the kids were active, all the kids were engaged, and there was a lot of, um, a lot of laughter and joy going on in that room. Right, and when you see something like this and you walk in, you're like, oh no, this PE teacher doesn't know what they're doing. But I think it's because ingrained in our head, we see, you know, we see it in different movies, um, and we think structure and military lines and whatnot, but that's not what's best for our students. Research shows that an exercise approach for our students is not appropriate. It's the physical activity approach. Um, and so, yeah, we need to be teaching the GLEs and standards, but we can have fun with it. Um, something very similar to this with the high school, because I don't want to leave out our secondary teachers, um, that sport ed um, approach that I talked about, the sport ed curriculum, you pre-assign those teams and it stays the same within a unit. So those roles that I mentioned, the the coach, the fitness trainer, whatever you do, that stays the same for however many long you're in the unit. Um, and then that's somebody's job. When y'all come in, I'm checking, I do nothing and I'm giving them points. If you are the first team to be dressed in from, um, you know, dressing in, your team gets 10 points. If you're the second team, you get eight. If you're, you know, the third and so forth, the first team that gets started with their exercises, that person is doing their role and they get points for that. And that's that self-initiation of procedures. Whenever it's time for the game, I say, okay, it's game. You have 30 seconds to get going. The referee is in charge of making sure the captains get to the middle to rock, paper, scissor for who gets ball first. And they start that. Um, so that's all self-initiated and they have their folders thoroughly explaining what the job is for the day. And then my job as the teacher is to give them feedback on their roles and how they're doing. And then at the end of that unit, the scores will be 452 to 375. 
five because I'm not grading them on did they win or lose. I give two points for a win and one point for a loss. But all the other points are doing your roles and being responsible. So that's just kind of a suggestion. And that's in that book that I'll provide later. All right. So these are kind of the highly effective um, critical attributes that we look for within the conference rubric. So again, students take the initiative with their classroom uh, classmates. Students ensure transactions and routines are accomplished. Once you practice enough, you'll have those couple of students that are like, hey, stop, put your put it down, you know, be quiet. We need to know what's next because um, they know the expectations for the classroom. And then in any setting, I don't care how old your students are or not, they can be responsible for the equipment. I it's a biggest pet peeve when I go in and we have five or six groups and one PE teacher is trying to hand out equipment or reset equipment. It's another pet peeve when we do co-teach and I'm giving instruction and another teacher's in the back resetting the equipment. Well, that's distracting for the students. And also it's taking the responsibility away from the students and for them to take some initiative within their learning. Um, so those are just a couple of quick suggestions or examples. So again, students come in and begin the instant activity immediately without long instructional processes. So the way that a physical education class is kind of structured in general is an instant activity, that's an activity to do right when we come to the gym for them to be active. Most of our students have been sitting for long periods of time. Um, so we want them to be active within the first one or two minutes. Then we practice the skill for the day and then we have an application game. Um, and that's kind of the general structure for all games that's appropriate. Um, again, we already talked about students helping with equipment and then students placing the equipment at their feet. Um, so again, we've talked about kind of uh, restrooms, what, what should we do? What are the students' expectations when there's a substitute or if they need to go to the nurse? But these things are just practiced at the beginning of the year. Um, when I was teaching K-12, one of my second grade classrooms, it took us three days to get to the gym because we couldn't follow the right procedures to get there. Um, but after that three days, we never had a problem for the rest of the year. Um, and it's because we just practiced and they knew the expectations. Um, and some of that was coming from my principal and knowing the expectations of walking down hall where other classes were taking place. Um, but it's, you know, they, students can learn and we were able to get those procedures down. You have anything to add real quick, uh, Carrie? Um, no, just the, Kaylin gave the example earlier. We do that game called Go Fish. Um, we also do one that's around Thanksgiving turkey hunt that is a throwing activity, throwing rolling activity. And it is uh, a lot of equipment, but we do utilize those students to set up for the next class. And that is for sure something that, that should be done is, uh, is the students being held accountable for setting up and, and using the equipment properly. Perfect. All right, so um, instruction, questioning and discussion uh, techniques. So the key takeaways from this area within the conference rubric are that question and discussion should help deepen student understanding. And this, this is not just a quiz, right? What are the skill cues of an underhand toss? That's great and important. It might be developed in the appropriate for kindergarten. But again, we need to be asking questions that has to do with the strategies of the game. It doesn't matter how big a volleyball court is or a tennis court. That does not, that's not applicable to gameplay. Teachers should use several different strategies and all students should be engaged. And a lot of times that we do this, we can't hear from all 30 of our students, but a think pair share. We use those a lot in the classroom. We should use those in the gym. Get with the person next to you. Here's your prompt. Discuss it. And then take two or three hands a minute later. Okay, so students initiate higher order questions. And Carrie has a really good suggestion for this in a minute. Students extend the discussion and enrich it. And a lot of times if we're having PE once a week for 30 minutes, we can't fit it in. So this is where those out of class discussions might take place. And it could just be a quick discussion on whatever board you might use. Um, and then students just have to write a response and they might have to um, respond to one of their peers. And this could depend on if you're K-12, what's appropriate or not. Okay. Um, so Carrie, why don't you take this slide? So um, questioning and discussion techniques. One of the biggest things that uh, for peer assessment or any kind of assessment where I'm looking at a skill, I do a lot of things where I ask my students, okay, if I am looking and I see a perfect underhand toss, what are those things that I'm looking for? What would be something that I see? And that's a good way for students to, to help you create the rubric and help figure out, well, um, you should step with your opposite foot. You know, every student knows, okay, I'm gonna, when I throw, I'm gonna step with my opposite foot. So that's something good. Okay, great, wonderful. 
or even have the kids start telling you what to do and you do exactly as they say. And that's a good thing to bring that ELA in because they've got to use those words correctly and they can't say, well, you would do it like this. Well, like what? I want you to use your words. You use the words to describe how or what I should see. Um, another thing, um, we had a student, I was teaching in a speed stack unit and we do speed stacking because it's great for those reading techniques and, and hand-eye coordination. And uh, the student comes, you know, comes to me and says, Coach Lee, I just don't understand it. Why can't I ever do this right whenever, whenever you're watching, whenever I'm doing it for time? I always mess up. And I said, well, actually, that's a great question. Why don't you discuss it with your partner? And we stopped the class and we said, okay, why do y'all think that when someone's watching you, you might mess up? Well, that brought in a whole, a whole nother discussion of performance anxiety. Okay, well, I get nervous to take a test. I get nervous to perform in front of people. That's, you know, across all subjects, across all fields. Um, so it was a great discussion brought up by a student. Um, the other thing uh, that we talked about was I, uh, our school does a lot of I like, I wish. So anytime we're doing peer observation or peer feedback, we always have the students start with I like. I like the way you stepped with your opposite foot, but I wish you kept uh, your eye on the target a little bit longer instead of finishing following through too fast, keep that eye on the target and then follow through at the end. So the students can help with feedback um, in a positive way. I like the way you did this, but I wish you could do that, that better. Perfect. All right, we're going to quickly go through the next couple of slides. So engaging student learning, the key takeaways um, is that we don't just give instruction at the end of the lesson, but it should be throughout the whole thing. Um, instruction should help guide student learning, but it should, again, like I mentioned with the assessment piece, it should help guide our teaching to make sure we're needing, meeting the needs of the students. Um, okay, so again, I'm not going to go through all the highly effective, but I can send this out as a resource for y'all. So I'm going to get straight to the examples. So all students are actively engaged in the learning process. We've already kind of talked about this with making sure that we have appropriate equipment. If you don't have a lot of equipment or a ball for each person, stations are great or having two or three tasks that we can rotate students through so they can still be active. So even if you don't have a ball for soccer for every student, instead of having them stand in line, they could be doing some fitness running for the pacer because running is an important part of a soccer game. Um, students suggest to change the rules or equipment. So Carrie already mentioned this with the table activity. Another thing that, um, that goes to that third point is one thing that I've done with fifth graders before is I gave them a rubric and they had to use three specific mm -hmm. rules that I gave them on the rubric and they had a list of equipment they could use. In small groups, they developed gains with those rules. They had a week to work on them. And the following week, each day, a group got to teach their peers their game. And then everybody got to play their game. Um, again, this is great for higher level learning, um, that effective domain, them working together. And it was a really fun activity. Carrie, do you have anything to add? No, that was no. great. Okay, perfect. All right, finally, using assessment and instruction, the key takeaways. The lesson contains the beginning, which is that instant activity, a learning where we're really focusing on something specific, and it doesn't have to be a skill. What we're learning can be a tactic or a strategy of a game, or what we're learning can be teamwork. So we have a lot of times where the whole lesson is just on group building um, and certain activities, and then it has an end with a closure. There is reflection within the lesson. Often we do this at the lesson closure, but this can be during activities in that journal on like a worksheet. And then finally that there's a cognitive challenge that can't just be answered by filling in a worksheet. Um, so the critical attributes, but I'm gonna skip through the to the examples. So again, students help develop the criteria of the skill. So if I pretest and the students know what's gonna come on the post, I can ask them, like Carrie mentioned, what am I looking for? What am I gonna grade you on? Help me make this rubric. And that's a really good idea for them or send them home. That's a homework. Y'all, if you were to create a, a test or a quiz or a rubric on the underhand toss, go home and make it and bring it home for me. You're not going to grade it if it's right or wrong, but you can call it those kids that did a really great job. You can see for yourself which kids are understanding it and getting it. And they feel like they were a part of that process. Okay. Teachers actively providing specific feedback. So this is really important that I teach my students. Um, it's not just, hey, good job, good job. 
even if a kid's doing it right, you have to tell them what they're doing right or they're not going to do it and they're not going to be able to repeat that skill. We always talk about the feedback sandwich. Carrie, I love the way that you're following through. Make sure you're stepping with that opposite foot, but I really like that effort. That's giving her specific critiques of what she can improve on. And then we've talked plenty about peer evaluation and feedback. All right, so the last thing that we kind of want to touch note on is side note, um, some professional um, development. So some of y'all might be PE teachers and some of y'all are supervisors. So just real quick, what to expect from your physical educators Expectations should be that they collaborate with the classroom teachers. It's a dual process, um, that they support the core curriculum and that they're an asset to your school. Um, they provide quality PE. Again, it's not movie day. It's not an extra recess. We're not rolling out the balls. We're not all the stereotypes. It should be quality and we should hold our, our teachers up to that level. Um, what to expect from your classroom educators. So this is really important too because um, oftentimes it's up to the PE teacher to be the catch-all. We're the extra babysitter or we're in charge of giving teachers a break. Yes, that's important, but we are educators as well. We are teachers. We're not just coaches. Um, so we expect from classroom teachers that provide activity breaks. Um, my niece and my nephews, they're in school and they'll go into school from eight and they don't get a break until 11 or 11 20. So have activity breaks in the classroom. It doesn't have to be fancy or organized. It could just be play music and let students get up and stretch. Some can be in a lot of activity breaks aid in um, that core subject and I have a whole list. So if you're interested, email me. I'll send you a list of activity breaks. Support physical educators by not taking away recess. Don't take away physical activity. Don't um, keep students uh, making tests out from PE. Do reading remediation at another time. And then don't use unhealthy food as an incentive. This is a huge pet peeve. We reward with cakes and pizza and this, but that's not teaching a healthy lifestyle. And we're teaching that. And that's what's taking these bad habits into adulthood. Okay. Instead, we can say, you do a great job. The whole class brings back the permission. So you get 10 minutes added on to recess. That's just as beneficial as an incentive to students. And then finally, what we ask from you as administrators is support physical education and hold us accountable. We need to be head, uh, set to a higher standard, especially for my new teachers coming out. Often they're the only ones um, that are trying to do the right thing. And so it's really hard to do that when you might have four PE teachers at your school and they're all old school and they, they allow 20 minutes to dress out or they allow long lines. And it's really hard for new teachers coming out trying to do the right thing um, because there's no accountability in the gym or the administrator never even visits the gym. Treat them as professional ed educators and not a babysitter. And then send your teachers to relevant professional development. So if there's an opportunity for a teacher to go to Shape America Conference or the Health and Physical Literacy Conference every year or even the Layford Conference, send them because they're going to get a lot of this information, um, but 10 times more. All right, so we didn't leave a lot of time, but we have a couple of minutes. I'm sorry I rushed at the end. This is our contact information. So if you have specific questions, we have a couple of minutes to answer. Um, so ask in the chat, but if not, make sure to jot down our emails, um, to ask us any questions again, whether it's the sport education information, whether it's activity breaks for your classroom teachers, whether you're an administrator and you want information for what to look for. I'm in Lafayette. I can travel on my days off or when I'm not teaching carries in Baton Rouge. Maybe you want us to come to your gym and show you what we see through our eyes. We are willing to do that. We work with um, we work with healthy schools. We work with Layford. We have people all over the state that can come and be a resource for you. Okay, so write down. I'll put this up. Um, here's a scan me for um, healthy schools that will take you to some resources. And then if you could provide the session feedback, you can do that in the Sketch app, okay? We would love your feedback because um, we would love to present next year as well. Hopefully we'll be back in person next year. I will leave it on, on our contact information, but I enjoyed having y'all. We'll be around for a couple of minutes if you have any specific questions. Thank y'all so much for joining us today. Appreciate it. Thank you.
Oops. I guess we're just waiting till it goes to zero or until somebody asks a question. 